Can you leave that chair here for a second so I can see water? Uh, thank you so much for sticking around to hopefully listen to something that will be fairly decent. Um, I just wanted to really thank uh, Arnaud and all the staff here. Uh, this has definitely been a first-class experience. Uh, you know, uh, Alfonso, Marie, Yvonne, everyone, people in the sound and uh, video booth, thank you so much. Uh, and I also am grateful to be back in Mexico. I always feel so welcome when I'm here. And so uh, it's, I've traveled all over the world. And to be in Mexico, um, I always feel welcome. So thank you. So this is me. Um, uh, I'm the chief, technology officer for, chief, the chief technology officer for the Sacramento Kings. I've often described my job over the past three years as the, probably one of the coolest jobs in the NBA and probably even one of the coolest jobs in the world. Uh, here's where we're gonna go today. Uh, we're gonna talk about me, because that's the best, uh, that's one of my favorite topics sometimes, and it's the only topic that I do good at. Um, then we're gonna discuss how important it is, if you're gonna be innovative, how you have to be disagreeable, how you have to reframe problems, and how you have to remove constraints. And it is those characteristics that we used uh, in building our new arena that just opened uh, in October. Then, uh, I'm going to talk about Fast Company. Uh, just last week, we got the honor uh, to, be awarded, to be awarded the most innovative company in sports. Uh, and so, that's something that I'm very, very proud of. I'm very proud of our team, and uh, it's, it's been an, an amazing experience. Um, and then I'm going to talk about the a decade of innovation. We just didn't become the most technologically advanced uh, sports team uh, overnight. It's, it's taken a decade to actually get to where we are. Um, and then Golden One Center. I want to talk about how we changed the paradigm and how the arena uh, checks into you. And then I'll go specifics, specifically into uh, our data center, uh, how our goal was to have more code than concrete, our mission control, which, are which is our central nervous system for our fans, uh, and how we looked at every single detail, including the access points, to remove all points of friction. And then I'll talk specifically about my pride and joy, which is our scoreboard, uh, which is you'll, you'll get to see how I was disagreeable, how I reframed the problem, and how I removed constraints. So, me. Um, I started coding in the fifth grade with an Apple IIe. I imagine most of you probably don't even know what that is. This is a very young audience. I then graduated to a PS1, and then I was one of the first people to actually use Prodigy, just the concept of actually being able to send a communication to another person via email. This was a long time ago. And Way back then, I knew there was something going on with this thing called the internet. So I went to college. Uh, I built my first website in 1995. Uh, and then right after college, I decided to pursue another hobby, and that was to work with President Clinton. So I just graduated from college, and I had an amazing opportunity to travel around the world uh, to prepare all of his visits. I first started off by uh, by taking care and ensuring the logistics were set for his golf outings. And you would think that for a normal person, you just go out and golf, but for the President of the United States, you actually have to set up 10 golf courts and work with the military aid and the doctors and so on, just to ensure that it was successful. Uh, following uh, working in the White House and then working for two cabinet secretaries, I then went back to another hobby of mine, and that was technology. So back in 2005, 2006, I became the, the, essentially the chief technology officer for John Edwards when he was running for president. At the time, this was just at the beginning of what they call Web 2.0, and we embraced all of it. So he was the first to podcast, he was the first to video blog, uh, and he was the first to use Twitter. Uh, and so 
I was, you know, very young at the time, and I pushed him to use Twitter. And I said, you know, this is a, an amazing platform. You will be able to communicate directly with, with, your, with uh, your constituents. It's something that I had never seen before. Little did I know that someone else would use Twitter and take it to another level. Had I known that, <laughs> then what I know now, I probably would have never told him to use Twitter. But I, I think people were gonna use Twitter anyway. Um, so at the time, I was called a whiz kid. Um, and you know, uh, there was some really cool things that happened. Uh, but uh, I like to say to people that I had a great future behind me. It seems like it was all downhill from then because it was such an amazing experience. Uh, and then over the past several years, I've had a few technology companies. Some were quite successful. Uh, but I also went back to one of my hobbies and I worked again with President Obama uh, and the First Lady. And I, again, I traveled all over the world. I've been very fortunate to have traveled to to most countries, um, in you know, Iraq, uh, Mexico City, Africa. I've been all over the world uh, just preparing the visits for the president, and it has been an amazing experience, and uh, President Obama is someone who I hold in the highest regards and is a great person, and I've had a lot of opportunity. And I also happen to own the coolest dog in the world, this is my guy, Larry. We call him Mohawk Larry. And if you get a chance, please um, follow him on Instagram. I, I, I plan to make him really famous. So when you talk about innovation, uh, Malcolm Gladwell uh, cites a, in, in, in his book and in his talks uh, another Malcolm. And he said that there are essentially three, three things that you need if you're going to be innovative. And again, it's, you've got to be disagreeable. You've got to reframe problems. You've got to remove constraints. Does anyone know who this guy is? No one. Okay, it's pretty amazing. This guy not only transformed the shipping industry, but he transformed international trade, and as a result, international relations. His name is Malcolm McLean. What he did was he figured out how to make the shipping of cargo efficient and inexpensive. Because in the 1950s, shipping was chaotic. The ports were major choke, point, choke points to international trade. Loading and, loading and unloading of cargo was difficult and expensive. But what did Malcolm McLean do? He said, there's got to be a wet, better way. And by the way, there's also got to be a way where I can make some money off this. So when the other stakeholders in this chain were trying to solve the problem with their specific vertical, he looked at the whole picture. He looked at the way the trucks were made. He looked at the way the containers were made. He looked at the way those containers were loaded onto ships. And he reframed the problem. And so what he did was he redesigned the connection between the truck and the box, and he essentially created a retractable shipping container. And then he removed constraints. He then figured out that you needed like a railway system to go up and down the ship to load the cargo. And this is where we are today because of Malcolm McLean. He disagreed, he, removed, uh, he reframed the problem, and he removed constraints. And you can look at any major innovation, and you can, all, you can point to those characteristics of those people who've created that innovation. And this stuff's not difficult. Anyone can do this. And we use those same three characteristics to create the Golden One Center. Again, just last week, the most innovative company in sports uh, Forbes has said we're the most tech advanced uh, sports franchise in the world. Wired has said that our stadium is pretty much, pretty much a giant Tesla. Uh, uh, again, sports techie, uh, most tech savvy sports team, 2016. And then our arena is also the first pla lead platinum in uh, arena in the world. And again, 
So why technology? Why do we care so much about innovation at the Kings? Because it's all about the fans. Not only do we want to connect our fans to the players and our fans to each other and our fans to the city and the, then our city to the world, we want to make sure everyone is connected so that we can provide extreme value. And we're able to do this through technology, through innovation. And as I mentioned, technology just didn't start during the last three years. Innovating just didn't start three years ago. It's part of our DNA. So 2007, first team on Twitter, first team on YouTube, over a million YouTubes on video, uh, first team on uh, Foursquare, first team to actually use a hashtag campaign uh, to get our Rookie of the Year, uh, to become Rookie of the Year. Then 2013, we had a new ownership group, uh, and it was led by Vivek Ranadive, the guy in the upper left. Uh, he was the founder of Tipco Software, known as Mr. Real Time on Wall Street, digitized Wall Street. Paul Jacobs, chairman of Qualcomm. Chris Kelly, employee number 12 at Facebook. Andy Miller, who worked directly for Steve Jobs. So with this new leadership group, we've taken on a philosophy that everything that we do, we gotta be quick, quick. we gotta be agile, we gotta be efficient. And so we've taken on the philosophy of build, measure, and learn. And so as a result, we were the first team to use Google Glass. We were the first team to use drones. We were the first team to use virtual reality. We were the first team to uh, uh, use virtual reality to stream live to India and to a local children's hospital. We were the first team just to, a few weeks ago to uh, use Facebook Live in virtual reality. And we were the first team to actually use artificial intelligence in our app with our chatbot, Kai. So, because of this, because of our DNA, because we've had this ability to, to disagree, reframe the problem, remove constraints, we built this. And we changed the entire paradigm, and I'll get to that in a second. And we've made it so that the arena checks into you. Golden One Center is the most technologically advanced and sustainable arena in the world. Through innovative solutions and next generation hardware, Golden One Center has created an unmatched and enhanced fan experience. Wired Magazine recently called Golden One Center pretty much a giant Tesla. And the New York Times has hailed the arena as the most technologically advanced arena in the world. Through a first of its kind dual mode mobile app, fans are prepared with everything they need for a game night. The Kings and Golden One Center app provides fans with real-time information about the venue, traffic, in-arena experience upgrades, and the team like never before. It features the NBA's first chatbot, Kai, Kings Artificial Intelligence, to answer fans' questions. Powering the fan experience resides in the arena's 6,000 square foot next generation command center, housing a tier four data center, a first of its kind 4K broadcast control room, and the arena's central nervous system, Mission Control, where various teams make use of real-time information to ensure the best possible fan experience. The arena is also the first implementation in the world of multi-mode wide band fiber, allowing for lightning fast communication between the arena's processing computers. Powering the arena is a 200 gigabit per second internet connection, 17,000 times faster than the average home connection. Complementing the arena Wi-Fi is an advanced distributed antenna system, ensuring that every cell phone has reception. The arena is home to the NBA's most advanced video board. This 4K Ultra HD screen features over 32 million pixels and has four times the clarity of a standard HD TV. The board spans the length of the court and provides spectacular views all around the arena. Around the arena, 700 additional screens complement the center-hung 6,100 square foot video board. The infrastructure at Golden One Center is future-proof, meaning it's built to last for years to come. With over 1,000 access points, beacons, and sensors, the only limits on the network at Golden One Center are the user's devices. With over 1,000 miles of cable and an infrastructure designed to update with technology, 
Golden One Center is the first Coliseum of the 21st century. Thank you. So, again, we changed the paradigm. Before, and you, if you go to most uh, events, it's, sometimes it's a hassle. And a lot of times we're competing with the couch, an amazing couch at your home. We're competing with you know, the ability to watch on a, your own 4K screen. So we had to figure out how we could change the paradigm so that the arena, instead of you checking in, into the arena, the arena would check into you. And to do that, we removed all of the constraints. We removed all of the friction. And we made it so that our fans can come to the game and they don't have to worry about any of these other issues that they would worry about before. Where to park? Where's my ticket? Where's my money to pay for stuff? You can, go to, you can enter the arena without any cash, without any paper, and in some places, the, re the arena actually recognizes you with some facial recognition. And so our goal, as always, is to get our fans into the arena so that they can start to enjoy the game. And it starts with our app, which is a remote control to the arena. With our app, you have access to, to every amenity at the arena, from the ability to upgrade your seats, to order food, to see live replays, etc. And we have done more, uh, and because we've had you know, additional goals with technology, we wanted to ensure that uh, we would use data in, in ways that have ne had never been used before so that our fans could get a different and better understanding of the game. So we have advanced stats in our app, uh, live, pre live replays, et cetera. But to do this, we needed a strong core. Innovation is at our core. And it, this is a picture of our data center. It's a tier four data center, the same thing you find at Facebook, Google, Amazon, and so on. Uh, we have two 100 gig pipes that come into the data center. That, that's the same amount of bandwidth that would uh, power a town of 17,000 uh, homes. We have that same bandwidth to power uh, 17,000 fans. We have over 1,000 miles of CAT 6A cable to connect to over 3,000 devices. So our arena is really the smartest arena in the world. It's, you know, our goal was to ensure that it would listen to, speak to, interact, and really come alive to our fans. This is something unique. This is, this is mission control. This is really the nervous center of the arena. Most arenas and stadiums would never have anything like this. Again, we reframed, we reframed the problem with a goal to deliver the best fan experience in the world. In our mission control room, we have 12 to 15 different uh, stakeholders on any given night monitoring traffic, monitoring weather, monitoring guest relations. We want to ensure that the fan has an amazing experience. And we want to, we will know, we actually know, that we want to know that when, when they're upset prior to them being upset so that we could prevent it. Uh, in this mission control room, we use a lot of artif artificial intelligence um, so that we can really predict and just to ensure that every fan's experience is an amazing one. And more importantly, uh, that the arena continually updates and the arena continually gets better. And so that every time you come to the arena, it's always a better experience. Uh, this is our arena bus. Everything is managed through this bus so that we can have a real-time comprehensive event processing engine so that if you drop a hot dog, whether it's seen on camera, uh, a, a, a robot, or by, uh, by an actual human, uh, we'll, we're able to deliver that hot dog to you. Uh, even our check-in points, we, these are smart kiosks. People said, you know, no arena in the world has turnstiles anymore, but we looked at the data and the data showed us that with typical handheld scanners, it would take about, uh, it allowed a throughput of about 300 people per hour. With these, 1,000 people per hour. So for our first concert, Paul McCartney, we had over uh, 10,000 people in an hour enter the building. This is our robot. People ask, why do you need a robot? Well, we have a robot to ensure the safety and security of our fans. The robot works 24 hours, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Now to the scoreboard. Uh, this is a situation where people said this couldn't be done. It's the world's first 4K scoreboard. It's the world's largest indoor scoreboard. And when the designers came to us, 
they said, you know, they gave us a design for a traditional scoreboard, bigger, bulkier, et cetera. But no one really understood why these scoreboards were getting bigger. And so what we wanted to do was really put UI and uh, UX behind the scoreboard. And so uh, we actually brought in a Disney Imagineer. And what the Disney Imagineer did was he looked at it from the perspective of our coaches, of our players, of our fans. And he wanted to assure that everyone had the best viewing experience. So at the vertex of the board, it's only about three feet. And that allows our coaches and players to look up and always see the scores and the, the advanced data. Uh, for our fans, they only have to move their eyes five degrees, whether it's to see live game or stats. This scoreboard alone has over 35 million pixels. So this is a, a perfect example of how I disagreed with what I had seen. I looked at previous scoreboards, so I reframed the problem. And you know, we, we created the scoreboard so that it actually is useful for our fans. And we removed all constraints. When people said, well, you can't have a 4K scoreboard because the 4K control room doesn't exist. We said, let's figure it out. So thank you for your time. Um, and I believe we're available for questions.